Israel was taken by surprise earlier this week when Hamas stormed the borders. The attack, while surprising, has had huge ramifications both in the Middle East and the world. Leaders, particularly in the Western countries, have unanimously backed Israel and said that the country has a right to defend itself. But the fact that Israel did not expect this attack raises significant questions. A country that has one of the most advanced defense systems in the world had no clue. The Israeli government has since responded by declaring war on the Gaza Strip. But what does this declaration of war actually mean, both for Israel and the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip? What is Israel's plan now? And just what is the ultimate end goal of this war? This is Beyond the Headlines. I'm Ismail Na'ar, Arab Affairs Editor at The National. And this week, we'll speak to Israeli officials and analysts about the Israeli response and what has been described as failures of the government and subsequent diplomatic efforts since the Hamas attack on Saturday morning. But before we start, if you want to get all the latest episodes as soon as they come out, then just hit the subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcasts. How did Israel not know about this attack? That was one of the very first questions that many people have asked since the start of all of this. To get direct answers on this, I've spoken to Avichai Adrai, who is a lieutenant colonel and serves as the head of the Arab Media Division at the Israeli Army. There are lots of questions on how the Israeli army didn't know or got surprised on Saturday. All these are things the Israeli army has to respond to, but it decided at this time to put these questions aside and to answer it at the end of the war, because it announced the war. Military analysts have told the National that Israel's renowned Iron Dome was overwhelmed by the sheer volume of Hamas rockets launched from Gaza, which were on a scale no defense systems in the world could have dealt with. An estimated 3,000 rockets were fired, leaving hundreds dead and thousands injured. The inability of the Iron Dome to deal with Hamas's attack strategy left Israel vulnerable. But the first response was to regain control. <laughs> The first orders given to the military was to re-secure the south region because the border fence was attacked and broke from many parts and hundreds of attackers entered the Israeli lands. And we were able to regain control on Tuesday, which meant it took a lot of time. There are hundreds of dead bodies. Around 1,000 attackers from Hamas are thrown on the borders and inside Israeli towns. Adrai also said that Israel captured dozens of who he described as Hamas fighters and that they would be interrogating them. On October 7, the military wing of Hamas attacked towns and settlements. More than 1,200 people were reported to have been killed from both sides until now. More than 1,200 people were reported to have been killed from each side until now. Hamas claims to be holding more than 100 hostages who were seized when hundreds of its fighters crossed the border into southern Israel early on Saturday. Many analysts saw this as an attempt from Hamas to reach a prisoner's exchange deal with Tel Aviv. I've spoken to an official from Hamas earlier this week and they confirmed that exchanging hostages with Palestinian prisoners is an option. But they cautioned that it is still too early to reach a deal that would lead to a decrease in hostilities. This, however, seems not to be at the top priority of Israel right now. In many media interviews, including one with the spokesperson of the military, the country has stressed that its mission now is to completely obliterate Hamas's military capability, not the hostages. To get more on this perspective, I've spoken with former Israeli intelligence officer Avi Melamed, who was sitting at his home just north of Tel Aviv and with the backdrop of the constant drone of combat planes and explosions. He lives around 300 kilometers north of the Gaza Strip. We asked him a range of questions on his thoughts on how he saw the Israeli response. He answered all with an air of dejection and frustration at the situation. The current policy of Israel is something like, we are continuing the war plan and we will conduct the war plan as if there is no hostage issue. And we will deal with the hostage issue as the, if no, there is no war. If I try, if it makes, to, if it makes any kind of sense. Um, so I think this is the way to currently describe, I think, uh, the Israeli policy vis-a-vis that issue. 
It seems that Israel is adamant to fight with all its force. It has called up 360,000 reservists in one of the biggest mobilizations in 50 years. Following the declaration of war by Netanyahu as well, Israelis living abroad are flying back to Israel from across the world to join the conflict. I, I don't anticipate that this a military massive move of Israel will last for a very long period of time. Uh, it's likely to reach at some point uh, to some sort of like very clear uh, military picture on the ground. Um, as for the Israeli public opinion, so this is one major difference in comparison to all things that we saw in the past. The other difference, of course, is the place where Israel is located today, emotionally, politically, the public opinion, obviously, uh, the earthquake that uh, Hamas attack caused. So my understanding is that the Israeli military operation uh, is, um, and again, and I'm hearing what the leaders are saying, the Minister of Defense talking about uh, we are going to change reality in Gaza for the next 50 years. Netanyahu says we are going to change the Middle East. They are calling people for Gaza to flee to Egypt to save their lives. All indicators basically suggest that the, this is going to be, it's going to be very, very brutal. That was Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant announcing a complete blockade of Gaza which raised many concerns of a humanitarian crisis, especially that Israeli officials announced in several statements that it would not allow basic resources or humanitarian aid into Gaza until Hamas militants released the people it abducted during its surprise weekend attack. Food, electricity, and water are in perilously short supply, and two million Palestinians in Gaza are set to suffer. Again, Iran has pushed Gaza Strip to commit collective suicide and it's it's terrible it's so true i mean you know and it's terrible it's uh, you know i i feel very bad for innocent people in gaza strip you know like innocent people in israel um but um maybe it was inevitable and and maybe you know maybe it will come up as terrible as it may sound maybe this whole terrible situation in the end of the day will result in some place where it will be some sort of a future for both israelis and palestinians they deserve it we all deserve a future of hope rather than future of death and destruction pointless death and destruction israel is aware of the cost it might be paying to destroy hamas there were reports of a possible mediation efforts between the conflicting parties from Qatar as well as Egypt, but they were not welcomed from the Israeli side. This is what Lear Hayat, who is the spokesperson of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, told me this week. People understand the need of Israel to gain control, back control on the uh, border between Israel and the Gaza Strip, and to do whatever it takes in order to destroy the Hamas terror infrastructure in the Gaza Strip and to liberate the dozens of Israelis that were kidnapped and abducted by the Hamas terrorists. But mediation in this time, we are at war. This, there are still terrorists in Israeli territory. At this point, and as the conflict is entering its second week, and with no sign of accepting mediations from other countries, or at least starting talks on a short ceasefire, the war doesn't seem to be cooling down anytime soon. Hamas has taken dozens of hostages, and they want to use that as a pressure on Israel, while Israel seems to be focused on only one thing. Two goals for this operation. The first one is to secure the border and to make sure that there is no terrorist, Hamas terrorist, in Israeli territory. The second goal is to hit the Hamas terror infrastructure in a, a, 
in such a way that they will never be able to attack Israel in this way again. The third goal is to get to each and every one responsible for this barbaric terror attack and having to pay a price. A lot is changing in Israel right now on all fronts. Politically, the country realized it needs to reunite first. Netanyahu and opposition leader Benny Gantz finally agreed on Wednesday to form an emergency unity government and separately a war cabinet alongside Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. The new government will have a war cabinet that will include Mr. Netanyahu, Mr. Gantz and Mr. Gallant, while the broader emergency government vowed not to pass any legislation or decisions that are not connected to the war directly as long as the fighting continues. For several months, protests have been sweeping Israel against a set of judicial reforms put forward by Mr. Netanyahu. The proposal would simply give the government more say in hiring and firing of judges, and would block the Supreme Court from striking down laws put forward by cabinet and parliament. But all these discussions will be halted as long as the war goes on. That's it for today. For more information on what's happening in Israel and Gaza, keep an eye on thenationalnews.com. This episode was produced by Dua Afarid, Phil Green, Arthur Edison, and I'm your host, Ismail Naal. If you want to get every episode of Beyond the Headlines as soon as they're released, then just subscribe in your podcast app.